Hi, I'm Jamir Grillo, the conductor and the composer, and welcome back for another episode of Conducting Pills, a series where we take a repertoire piece, or a part of it, and we analyze it from a conductor's point of view. In this episode, we dive into Dvorak's Ninth Symphony, and specifically its first movement, and as usual, you can jump through different sections of the video by clicking on the links present in the description below. And now, let's start! Anthony Dvorak moved to the United States in December of 1892 to return back to his homeland of Bohemia only three years later. And yet, in those three years, he managed to write three of his most popular masterpieces. The American String Quartet, the Cello Concerto, and of course, his Ninth Symphony titled From the New World. Now, in Dvorak's own words, the real meaning of the title is Impressions and Greetings from the New World. So, the title From the New World was written by Dvorak himself as a joke before sending the autograph to his editor. It is often said that the American aspect of this music comes from the fact that Dvorak embraced the American idioms, the musical idioms of course, and infused them in his own music. While it is partially feasible, it also poses the question of what is American music? And are we talking here about Native American music, or are we talking about African American music, or a mix of both? Something that Leonard Bernstein, brilliant as usual, addressed in one of his legendary lectures. And while most American composers of the time considered American folk music somewhat of a second-rate music, something not to get mixed up with, Dvorak went exactly in the opposite direction. And faithful to his love for folk music, he mixed and matched the primitive American sound with the old European symphonic form, creating something that raptured audiences since its premiere. But how did Dvorak get acquainted with these folk melodies and rhythms? Well, legend wants that while walking down the hall of the National Conservatory of Music, of which he was a director, he heard a young student singing. This young student was actually working uh, as a janitor to help uh, paying the cost of his own education. And Dvorak was struck not just by his voice, but specifically by the song that he was singing. And from then on, this student sang for him many times, and Dvorak immersed himself in the world of Negro spirituals. As much as this symphony is imbued with these tunes, it remains as classical as it gets in terms of structure. The first movement is in a typical sonata form, with a slow introduction, an allegro, an exposition with the first and a second theme, a development, a recapitulation, and a coda. As much as he loved America, Dvorak always longed for his homeland. And the opening of the symphony presents exactly that in its slow, longing theme. which is interrupted almost immediately by a calling of two horns. The scene repeats, changing color from the low strings to the woodwinds, but then instead of being interrupted by the two horns, we have a shock and violent explosion of the orchestra. It's an unexpected moment of very high energy, something that the audience of the time would have not expected. And as conductors, we should try to preserve the surprise effect by avoiding big and obvious gestures and try to keep the gestures focused in front of the orchestra. This surprising moment lets us know that the quiet is already gone. The syncopation of the woodwinds introduced the thematic cell based on the pentatonic scale. that will be the base for the entire movement. Many people have pointed out that this is the first hint towards American music in virtue of that pentatonic scale so largely used in traditional American music. However, the pentatonic scale had already been used in many other parts of the world. And without going too far, in Bohemia, for example, Dvorak's home country. Not to forget that Debussy in the same period has started toying with it, and with many other scales for that matter, drawing inspiration from uh, a gamelan orchestra that he had heard in Paris. This introduction ends with a succession of syncopation, diminished seven, and timpani strikes, 
which is remarkably similar to the end of the introduction of the last movement of Brahms' first symphony. As we know, Brahms was one of the first to endorse Vorjek's compositional genius. We're driven into the Allegro, where the first theme is rich of the typical Dvorak's melodic invention. Played by the same two horns that had that calling moment in the very beginning, the third and fourth horn. And then flowing naturally from one section to another. On the fifth bar of the Allegro, keep the accents of the woodwinds in the piano sonority and notice that they have no dots on top. We drive that into an explosion of energy. The first theme is played by the bassoons, trombones and two horns on top of cellos and basses, while the rest of the orchestra responds with rhythmic elements. And here comes another theme that's often referred to as purely Native American. And certainly one can understand why by looking at the way it is constructed. A modal scale, Aeolian in this case, on top of a pedal in fifths. However, there are some problems with considering this specifically and only or exclusively American. First of all, Dvorak had never met any Native Americans, and we're not really sure how much he could identify as Native American versus African Americans in terms of music, of course. And tunes had not been transcribed and catalogued yet, which certainly blurred the contours between different folk areas. And secondly, the use of mode, however associated with some folk and Native American music, had already been used in Gregorian music, in medieval music, as well as in Greek and Hindu music. Nonetheless, the inventiveness of this theme is extremely evocative. But as it happened with the first theme, Dvorak ramps up the energy almost immediately, using first the entire thematic cell, and then just a part of it. As per tradition, we would expect the end of the exposition, but Dvorak here breaks off a bit by introducing a third calmed and relaxed theme. Now, perhaps this theme was inspired by a spiritual called Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, and the resemblance is remarkable, especially if one takes it from the chariot part. However, Dvorak himself always insisted on the fact that it was just a resemblance in the use of the pentatonic scale and nothing more. Register the flute line with your left hand. It will make a connection visually as well, and your hand will be in perfect position to tie with the first violins at the end of the phrase, catching them and then moving on with them. Although very far away in character from the first theme, the third theme is almost exactly the same from a rhythmical point of view, building in this way an ideal bridge and giving cohesiveness to the entire movement. Before going into the development, there's a repeat sign which I firmly believe should be observed. See, there's so much thematic material in the exposition that to me it makes very much sense to hear all of it again. Besides, this symphony might be more than a hundred years old, but remember that in the audience there will always be somebody who will be hearing it for the first time. The same third theme that we just left is picked up by a solo horn, a piccolo, and echoed by the trumpets. It's an extraordinary moment of transformation of sound where we see the music material taken by the composer and molded into something completely different. And the drama intensifies as the trumpets take over, and the trombones answer with the first theme. And then we go again, this time with the horns. Initiate the forte sonority and then let it be, without 
insisting otherwise you'll get a harsher and harsher sound especially from the brass section and the energy builds up using the same material in its original form or in bits of it and Vorjak uses here a few composing tricks all at the same time he shortens the values, creating a natural chillerando going from 8 notes to triplets to 16 notes. At the same time, he moves up half a step at a time, a typical progression that adds intensity and drive. And to top it off, he uses triplets in crescendo in the horns against the quadruplets of the violins, reaching the climax. Now, at this point, the energy starts to dissipate, and within a few bars, we're taken into the recapitulation. Now, the third and fourth horn expose the first theme once again, followed by the oboes, and then the strings. But it's a shorter version of the exposition, and we're soon taken to the second theme, played this time by a very warm and solo second flute. And notice also how, compared to the first time, the sforzandi and the accents are completely gone. Now, on bar 358, it's very important to take care of balance, especially in the lower register. And notice how the dynamics between cellos and basses are different from one another. The same second flute is in charge of playing the third theme as well. Followed by the violins, which in the key of A flat, which we are in at the moment, sound very luminous while retaining a certain weight in sonority. And after this bucolic moment, we're taken into the coda with a crescendo to three Fs. And here is something that truly marks a great composer. The ability to combine all different themes or parts of them, transfiguring their character in the most natural way. Interestingly enough, nothing from those first few bars that we heard in the beginning, that melancholic and longing first few uh, notes, comes back in the coda. And that calm and relaxed third theme is turned again into something powerful and dramatic, counterpointed by the first theme. <laughs> That very first theme is shortened and presented again. And then stretched all the way to the end, storming through the last bars where only its first rhythmic element is left to close the movement. And something that I find really useful, whether you're studying this piece as a conductor or not, is to read another source of inspiration for Dvorak, according to Dvorak himself, actually, as he himself has pointed out many times. The Song of Hiawatha by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. If you read the ending of this poem, you also see the end of the symphony, as well as its beginning. The sorrows of departure which are depicted in the poem permeates the entire symphony top to bottom. But did you enjoy this video? Then don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking on the subscribe button below the video. And let me know in the comments what you think about this masterpiece. And I will see you next week for another episode of Conducting Pills, where we will talk about Schumann's Third Symphony. Till then, bye-bye.